Genesis 17, verses 1 to 22. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan, for a perpetual holding, and I will be their God. God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old, including the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money must be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ismael might live in your sight. God said, no, but your wife, Sarah, shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ismael, I have heard you. I will bless him and make him fruitful and exceedingly numerous. He shall be the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this season next year. And when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. So if scriptures were printed on Jenga blocks, today's scripture would be at the bottom. This is one of the ones that's kind of has others built up on it. If you take it out, some of the others don't make as much sense. It makes some of the other stories wobblier and you wonder why is that in there? So much of the biblical story builds on this covenant with Abraham and Sarah. So much of the Hebrew Bible grows from their family tree. 
as you came in today, you may have even picked up one of the activity sheets. And if you want, you can get one on the way out that have the family tree of Abraham on it and kind of see where it goes. And if you go back a generation or two, you even see that some of these wives that come in are connected to Abraham's family's family. They come back around. This passage today isn't just important in our faith story as Christians and even as Jews, but even to the Muslim community. Our scripture today is a slice of a family tree and of a covenant that puts much of the rest of scripture in context. Now, Abraham has already been in our story since chapter 12. God calls he and his wife and family away from the familiar of home where they had lived and been for so long, and sends Abraham and Sarah on a journey of faith, of love, of common sense. And sometimes they come through these challenges okay, their faith intact, their love strong, their common sense often questioned. But for the most part, they do pretty well. It's a family that clearly understands the importance of taking care of other people. It's a family that also has the same human characteristics that many of us have. Fear, doubt, a little paranoia, a lot of impatience. As you read Abraham and Sarah's journey, you see the mistakes they make along the way, but how they grow from it. And this promise to make a great nation from Abraham and Sarah, it's not new either. It's been around for a few chapters the covenant is not just spoken of in this passage, although this is the one passage that obsesses over circumcision. So it's always fun to read it in worship and watch all the men squirm. Remember, a lot of these traditions that get added into scripture are cultural. There are things they did. And so as grandmas passed these stories down, they said, why do we do this? And she said, well, back in Abraham's day, they started it and we still do it. A lot of these are answers to questions people ask of why is this? So one of our challenges as we read is to try to figure out why was the story passed on? Not just why was it told, but why was it kept? What is it about God and us that we learn in this story that's made it so important to pass on, and in the context of this story, that's made it so core to others. Part of it's the impatience. Abraham and Sarah get impatient about the whole thing. They worried about this promise of a child that had not come as they had gotten on in years. They panicked that they were getting old beyond the birthing age as a couple, and they were fearful that God couldn't follow through on God's promise. So they tried to do it their own way. Have you ever seen people try to act on behalf of God and mess it up? Yeah, it's called the church over the last 200 years. They tried doing things on their own. Hagar is a servant of Sarah's, a handmaid. There's another way to call this. She's a slave. She's a person who has no control over her own life. She does not have agency in this situation. She is fulfilling her status role. Abraham and Sarah use her to have a child in Sarah's name because she belongs to Sarah. Remember, when we talk about biblical family values, there's some stuff we don't always want to talk about, right? So Hagar has a child with Abraham, and the child is named Ishmael. And at some point, Sarah makes Hagar feel unwelcome. Can you imagine why? Jealousy, inadequacy, all the things human beings would feel. Hagar and Ishmael flee twice at different points because of Sarah. And at both points, God meets them and sends them back. Promising to make a great nation of Ishmael. And Hagar along the way is the first in the Bible that names God. I say this because it is through Ishmael that the Muslim community claims their connection to Abraham and to God. So when Muslim friends talk about Allah, they are talking about the God of Abraham. Their covenant is in our Bible. We can't dismiss it without dismissing our own covenant with God. We can't belittle their understanding and covenant with God without undermining, yanking the Jenga block out from our own. Along the way, God assures this aging couple 
Abraham and Sarah, that they will have a child of their own. And that's where the Christian and Jewish traditions follow the story from this child. Today's scripture, though, also has not only a reminder that God will follow through on this promise, God's language changes a little bit. Back in chapter 12, Abraham leaves home. God says, go through your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, a great nation, and bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. But then the whole Hagar Ishmael thing happens. And in chapter 17, God states the covenant this way. Abraham fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. Ye shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, be ye shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly faithful. And I will make nations of you. And kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring. Two changes in this passage. The name changes from Abraham, from Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah. Not huge. You know, that's kind of the amount of name change from when you're in junior high to high school and you're now Mike, not Mikey anymore. It's not drastic. But also the number of nations changes and the two are related. Genesis 12 has God making a covenant with Abram to make descendants a great people. Genesis 17 has God making a covenant with Abraham to be the descendant of many nations. Abram means exalted father. Sarai means princess. An exalted father and a princess. Names well suited for a younger couple headed on a long journey. A couple still imagining what their life might be. Names of hope of what might come to be. And maybe possibly a little of how Sarah's attitude was when she was younger. Who knows, princess? Names well suited for what they might be. But years later, after a lot of ups and downs, God does more than they imagined. God takes their mistakes, their impatience, their worst moments, and turns them even into a larger, expansive covenantal community. God turns an even larger community out of this journey. Abraham, Abraham means father of multitudes. You just change a little bit of it in the Hebrew and the meaning shifts. Sarah translates as noble woman. She's not just a princess anymore. She is a noble woman, wise from the journey with experience to pass on to the generations that follow. Abraham's not just a father figure anymore. He's a leader whose hospitality, whose faithfulness will be a marker, will be a model for people to follow for generations. One of the most important pieces to name in this scripture, though, is the shared roots that covenantal communities have. The Jewish community the Muslim community, and the Christian community. It's interesting the loopholes we try to find in covenants to get out of them, right? Yet we are all bound in covenantal relationship with the same God. It might be easier to think about in a family context. You might have three siblings who are all bound in covenantal family relationship to one another coming from the same system or nuclear family. But that doesn't mean they don't look for loopholes to avoid dealing with each other. That doesn't mean they don't have hurts between each other, history between them. It doesn't mean there aren't things they have to work to overcome, but they can't pretend they're not related. Yeah, you can make one the black sheep of the family, but that still makes them part of the family. And often the ways we divide say more about us than the person, right? Our covenants have been expressed in different ways. But the covenants of three faiths are in this story. Another important thing to name in this scripture is what God promises. What God promises. God promises to be God. It's as simple as that. 
That's the basic promise. God will be God to all generations and help them make a home and a land where they were aliens. In a new place, wherever they find themselves, God will be with them. God's promise is, I will be God and with you. That's it. It's not things will go well. It's not you'll be rich. It's not that you will fit the cultural norms. It's not that life will be easy. It's not that you won't get sick. It's not that you won't face hardship. It's not that you will have a good stock portfolio if you were a good faithful Christian. There is no prosperity in here. There's a promise of presence to be God to all generations. Some might read this as two promises, but the second promise of presence really goes with the first. God is God, no matter where we go. We can make our home anywhere and God will meet us there. We also have to remember that others have the same covenant. It's easy to think that wherever I go, God is with me and I can make a home there. But if somebody else wants to come into my space and settle in, mm -mm, God couldn't be with them. God is with us wherever we go. God is with them wherever they go. And God can help us all form communities of covenant. That means people will come into our circle we have yet to meet. The number of people who will love us and who we will love, we have yet to meet yet. As God's covenantal people continue to grow into community with each other. This covenant in scripture reminds us we cannot dismiss those we might consider alien, those we might consider other, those that our legal system might deem illegal, those we wish didn't live in our neighborhood, those we wish would get a home and stop being homeless, like that just happens. Those we wish would keep their truth in their closet, those we wish would keep their politics to themselves. We're supposed to live together, to be who we are, to be who God made us to be, and figure out how to live together, to let everyone make a home where they are, and to see God in each other, to proclaim God's presence among one another, to honor it in the ways we interact. Years later, years later in this story, the descendants of Abraham will find themselves going to Egypt when there is a famine. They will settle there. They will become enslaved themselves. Karma. And at some point in the story, new laws will be given to them. As they leave Egypt and try to figure out how to do this on their own, they'll get new laws, and those will get applied to this covenant. We have since then added all kinds of Christian rules to the covenant, right? Thou shalt wear a silver ring and never have a hormone. Thou, will ne thou shalt never say a curse word because the nuns have said so. Thou shalt never sell, tell grandma she is wrong because she has a chuleta and the power of God behind it. Whatever cultural things we've added on to the biblical story, whatever rules we have made up, we've read the original covenant today. And what's God's promise? To be God. And what was Abraham and Sarah's job? To be God's people. God never said, follow the rules or I won't love you anymore. God never said, if you don't do these things, I'll kick you out. Nowhere in the covenant is there an out clause for God. God has no loopholes. That's our thing. We're looking for the exit ramp. We're looking for the way out of the tough time. We're looking for the easy path. We're looking for a way to avoid reconciling the hard hurt instead of facing our responsibility. God sits in the hurt with us. God sits in the disappointment with us. God sits in the hope and the potential of what we could be with us and God's willing to do the work with us. God has no loopholes. We inherit a covenant that is thousands of years old thousands of years old. We inherit a covenant of community, of God and God's people, that we find ourselves 
included in whether we chose it or not. So that's one of the crazy things about church. A lot of times we either baptize or bless babies before they have a choice, right? And sometimes they resent it later. Well, they made the decision for me. Well, no, we made the decision to love you whether you wanted it or not. You're welcome. Now, for the churches and the times that we have been judgmental and condemned you for a covenant you did not choose, we're sorry. That was wrong. Because we know the core of the covenant is God is God and God claims us as God's people. And we can't get out of that. God's love persists regardless of us. So we have a story that shows us what true covenant can look like. What are yours looking like today? What covenants have you made? What oaths with friends to never forget each other? What was written in the side of yearbook photos? Stay the same, I promise, and I will too. Promises made to family to live up to expectations that we could never fulfill. Promises made to family that were bound in secrecy of who we really were. How many covenants over the years have you felt trapped by? What covenants have you made on your own? Professions of love, confessions of love lost, pronouncements to God of what you wanted to do with your life. Now, let's be honest. There's a difference between a covenant and a promise made in distress. A promise you make in distress, God's smart enough to know what you would have gotten on that test had you not crammed all night. God understands the prayer of longing. God, I will do whatever you want if you just bring my love back. If you just heal my mom or my dad. If you just give me next month's rent. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about covenants relationship, not where we ask God something and offer our brokenness in exchange, but where we come as we are and trust God to love us as we are and invite God to be part of our journey, to meet us where we are and trust God will be present and then live our lives as if God is present. How will we live our lives in covenant what promises will we give each other in true covenant? What bound, loving relationships can we form in covenantal communion, exemplified by what God did with Abraham and Sarah? We say, I'm going to love you for the rest of your life. And I'm going to hope you love me too. Can there be a more vulnerable covenant than what God gives these people? How do we live that out? How do we offer covenantal love and relationship to one another? Throughout scripture, people are trying to live up to this covenant, trying to control each other with this covenant, arguing over what the covenant really means. But we need to remember nowhere in it does God say, if you fail, you go to hell. Nowhere. People said that. Nowhere in it does God say, if you fail, I'll stop being God for you. God never says it. People do all the time, but God doesn't. Nowhere in it does God say, I will not love you if. That line is nowhere in scripture. These are all manipulations of people to control a covenant and to control other people throughout scripture and throughout history. We have seen people try to live up to this covenant, try to control the covenant and argue about the covenant. But maybe the best thing we can do is just remember the original promise. Let God be God and try to grow like Abraham and Sarah. Amen.